Okay, it's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Kwame Kwe Armand. Kwame is a perfect example of why we must keep the arts essential. Like many students, the arts were a means for Kwame to escape poverty and excel. He lived in South Hall, London, where his mother was a night nurse and did hairdressing work during the day, and his father did an evening shift. In 1979, Kwame lived right in the middle of the South Hall riots, where from his bedroom, he witnessed police chasing black and Asian boys along the street, followed by skinheads who also had batons and shields. The local pub was on fire. He looked out from his window and he knew at that moment that he resolved to do well in his education. And it's an event he captured in his first play, A Bitter Herb. Kwame has numerous appearances on stage, television, and radio. He first achieved fame as a medic on the BBC series Casualty. And one that he's very proud of is he's in the starring role in the BBC adaptation of To Serve With Love. He excelled also as a playwright, and his fifth play, Almina's Kitchen, was nominated for Best Play for the Lawrence Olivier Award, and he received the award for Best New Playwright from the Evening Standard. He also excelled not only as an artist, but as a humanitarian. He's been named Goodwill Ambassador for the Trade for Christian Aid, Chancellor of the University of the Arts in London, and Artistic Director for the World's Arts Festival in Senegal. We in Maryland are very fortunate to have him as Artistic Director now at Center Stage. His creativity, artistic ability, and passion enhance our vibrant arts community. It is now my pleasure to introduce this new superstar of the Baltimore art scene, Mr. Kwame Kwe Armand. Thank you, John. That was um, my speech. <laughs> um, but seriously, thank you so much for inviting me this morning. I have to say this morning because, uh, uh, well, actually, I don't even know if it is morning. I, I'm writing at the moment a new play for the theatre, and then when I write, I write through the night. So I kind of finished at about 4 a.m. this morning, and then my body said, remember, you're speaking at 8. <laughs> Um, so if you see me dozing off, it really isn't you, it really is that Act 3 is defeating me. <laughs> I, I said yes, actually, when asked to come today, because arts and arts education means everything to me. Thank you, actually, for, it's, it's, it's so funny sometimes when people introduce you, and my thing is always, oh, don't say anything about me, and then you kind of... You, sometimes you just hear things afresh. And it's really interesting for me this morning to, to, to remember actually looking out of my window and seeing that which I saw, and that being, as you said, a catalyst many years later for the voice that I, that I would like to have developed. Art is quintessentially everything to me. I don't know how to define myself other than through the prism of art. I know there are, there are many neuroscientists at the moment working out if there is a me, if the me exists. But if the me does exist, I cannot separate the me from those three letters, A-R-T. It, it defines me in a way, not, and not just aesthetically, again, as I said, I'm writing, so please excuse the hair on my face, but I'm one of those artists that kind of likes to reward myself with a, with a haircut and a shave when I get to the end of the narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Old fashioned it is, but, uh, and, but forgive me for, for, for that. But it, art has taught me, probably second to my mother, my role model, the person who taught me how to be a man, a person who taught me how to view the world. 
Second to her, the biggest lessons I have received in my life has been through the pursuance, the negotiation, the battles, the victories of art. As a young man, I remember saying to my mother that I, I wanted to be a singer. And so she sent me to a school um, then that specialised in the art. And though this week, <laughs> this is very odd, this week I, I you know, as you, we do, we think about, sometimes you wake and you just think about the people who are really special in your life. And there was one teacher, my music teacher, Miss Jane Latuza. And, um, and I, I'm still in contact with her now, and she's in her 90s. And she supported me in a way that I, I don't know how I would have got through without the lessons that she taught me about myself through art. As I got older, I, I was a musician at first, and I was, I was a singer-songwriter, and I got to about the age of about 26, and I had a couple of recording deals here in the States, here in, in England, and, and it hadn't quite worked. And I had a recording studio in my house at that time, it was worth probably about $100,000. And I remember I woke up at 26, I'd had my first son, and he used to sit on my lap and press the sampler and go, yeah, Yep, 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 yep. And, um, or something like that. And, um, and I woke up one morning and I said, I don't think this is going to work for me. I think this will either kill me or define me. And at the time I was a young man and I had many abs, so I felt I had all the definition I needed. <laughs> Again, I did say I was a younger man. And, um, and I... I woke up that morning knowing that this was a life or death moment for me. And I woke up and I called my friends and I said, I am giving away my recording studio. I'm not gonna, I don't want anyone to buy anything, just come. Just come and collect. And people came and they just took keyboards and samplers and mixing desks. And I knew that had I not done that at that moment in that time, mentally, I may not have survived. There were other times when I had written songs. Now we all know, those of us who practice art, those of us who do it, and even teach it, we all know there's some things, and just everybody actually, there's some things in life that you do for others. There are some things that you do in life because you think that will bring you a modicum of success, and there are other things you do in your life that you don't care if nobody else in the world likes it, it's for you. I remember writing a, a, a song once that I, my publisher at the time was going, no one's going to do this song. No one's I was just like, I want to, I've done, this is for me. And there were many times when I was in very low moments of my life and I would come back to that song, put it on my headphones, listen to the words and it would give me the strength to make whatever decision I needed to make at that time. I could go on with stories throughout my life. But fundamentally, if I were to cut to myself, I profoundly believe that after the red thing, that <laughs> art would come. But it, it, is, it is just there. <laughs> I don't know how to see the world other than through the lens of art and through the lens of community. And so often, when I, in Britain, when I would be asked, I would go into schools to speak about my journey through art because many of my peers found themselves caught up in low criminality when they were 13 and 14. And the thing that kept me, apart from the fear of my mother breaking down and crying and, uh, and doing other things, um, the real fear was that the thing that I most wanted to do with my life, if I got into trouble, I could not do. As I became a man and I defined myself, I realized that there were many things where many of my friends were out doing other things. I was like, I need to sit at home and write this experience. I need to write through this anger. I need to write through this pain. I do not know a way of negotiating life other than through the prism of art. And I was terribly excited the other day when I came across a book by a man called Daniel Pink. Does anybody know that author? Yeah. 
And when he said we are now moving into the era of the right side of the brain. Where we all know there is no longer going to be a job for life. We all know that we are going to have to negotiate three or four. We all know now that we've moved through the age of the left brain dominating. And we're now living in a world of design. Where design is even more important often than its essential act. That how Apple makes a computer look beautiful is why it is, as well as work beautifully, is why it is the leading company in the world. I heard even General Motors said, we're not in the motor business now, we're in the arts and entertainment industry. <laughs> it's, it's tremendous to understand, actually, that the world is now shaping itself through the prism of art. I often say this, that civilizations and cultures are judged not by its great accountants, not by its brilliant bankers, but through the art that it produces. If I say Egypt, you think of. If I say the Mayans, you think of. If I say Greece, you think of. We enter, judge cultures through that prism. How advanced were you? What did your art say? How then, is, how important is it then that you, the facilitators of art to our youth, how important is it that you, as you said, John, are celebrated on a day like today? That you celebrate yourselves, celebrate the existence of art, and actually celebrate even that we're in Maryland, which I now know as a resident, a proud resident of, is right at the forefront of supporting its artists and its artistic institutions. I'm, I'm really proud to say that because please remember I come from Britain where the arts is funded very heavily through the government, through the arts. How important is it at my theatre that we have young children, as young as four, coming through our buildings? It is essential. How essential is it that during our summer schools that we make sure that young people, rich, poor, middle class and working and under, are able to access their own creativity through our building, it is essential to my mission here. How important is it that we create work that young people walk away from and say, oh, I could do that. It's as important as creating work that you as artists and you as teachers and you as facilitators can walk away and feel revitalized, entertained, and encouraged to continue to do the great work that you do. Art is not just essential to this young man from Southall and West London. It has saved my life, guided my life, defined me, and allowed me to come in front of you with much hair upon my face. <laughs> But it's also important to my children. And as my children now live here, please know that center stage is always open to, to anything that you want to, that any time you need assistance in any way, please do not hesitate to contact me. Anything that we're doing where you think we're not doing enough, do not hesitate to contact me. And when we're doing something really brilliant, please do contact me. <laughs> I finally just want to end by congratulating you, hoping that today emboldens you, helps you, strengthens not just those in this room, but all of those who you influence and affect. Thank you so much. <laughs>